Hello, BookTube. It's a bleak and barren Sunday here at Hyde Cottage, uh, which is my code name for Sundays when I get no mail, when I no free books come in the mail, and so I'm sad. Uh, but it turns out that uh, something that's happened a couple of times before happened again. I was very caught up yesterday in other things. And last night, totally unexpectedly caught up in other things. So yesterday afternoon, I heard the doorbell ring. I went out. I talked with my mail carrier. We, we had a fine uh, chit-chat. He handed me over an armload of packages. I set them down, and <laughs> believe it or not, I forgot about them. <laughs> and, and the same thing is true for the long stretch of this morning, where I was having so much fun writing that I forgot about anything else except taking care of Frida. And that brings us to now, <laughs> when I actually have books to show you on a Sunday. Uh, so it's it's not many, but we'll see what we have here and whether or not they're of any interest to warrant being done on Easter Sunday. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this is a paperback of something I never actually wrote about. I, you, amazing to me, but I, I never actually did. Uh, this is a paperback that comes out in late April, although I guess... Uh, I guess paperbacks it doesn't really matter. Uh, and it is uh, John Julian Nor Julius Norwich, the famous historian of Venice, and it is uh, four princes. Henry VIII, Charles V, Francis I, and Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, just, a, it's a, a, you know, a keyhole snapshot of their time as seen through four royal biographies. I read it. I liked it. I don't really know why I didn't review it. Uh, but this will give me a chance to read it again. <laughs> As I mentioned before, I, it's been a while. I'll give it another read, see if there's anything big I missed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what have we got here? Okay. Uh, this is White Hot Grief Parade by Alexandra Silber. It's billed as a memoir. comes out in uh, July... A powerful and luminous story of grief and coming of age and a beautiful tribute to the relationship between a father and a daughter. Alexander Al Silber, our author, seems to have everything, brilliance, beauty, and talent in spades. But when her beloved father dies after a decade-long battle with cancer when she is just a teenager, it feels like the end of everything. Lost in grief, Al and her mother hardly know where to begin with the rest of their lives. Into this grieving house burst Al's three friends from theater camp, determined to help out as only drama students knew how, and they're moving in for the duration. Over the course of that winter, the now five-strong household will do battle with everything death can throw at them, meddling relatives, merciless bureaucracy, soul-sapping sadness, and endless Tupperware. They will learn almost everything about love and will eventually return to the world, altered in different ways by their time in a home by the river. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so what do we know about this author? An actress and singer who starred most recently as uh, Tetzel in the Broadway revival of Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, and she is the author of the debut novel After an Ekva. Uh, Sorry about the interruption of the siren there. The kitchen fires don't stop, even on Easter Sunday. Uh, uh, she lives in New York City, so she is... Uh, and she's appeared in all three incarnations of Law and Order. <laughs> what does that mean? She received a Grammy nomination for a portrayal of Maria in the recording of West Side Story with the San Francisco Symphony, and has appeared in all three incarnations of Law and Order. Well, I don't need to tell most of you that Law and Order has had a lot more than three incarnations, <laughs> but, uh, but one way or another. Okay. That, uh, so it's a memoir. Okay, great. And I, I will certainly read it come July. It, the, the description, well, of course the book is not bounded by the description at all. The description makes it sound like a memoir written by someone who has never experienced anything even remotely close to grief, but, but <laughs> we shall see people experience that of course in different ways. So, uh, Okay, all right. This is another one that I uh, uh, that I didn't request. This comes out on the first of May. Uh, it's a translated work. Uh, it's a paperback original. Good, so it will be 
1695. That part's not good. It's 495 is what it costs to make with a profit, but uh, that's all right. 1695 is better than 35 uh, for something you don't know anything about. Um, so this is The Devil's Reward by Emmanuel de Villapin. Villapin? Look at that cover. <laughs> you can just glance at that while I read you. From award-winning French author Emmanuel de, la Villa, de Villapin comes a multi-generational novel that illuminates the strength and complications of mother-daughter relationships. Why, more mother-daughter relationships? Uh, just in time for Mother's Day, The Devil's Reward is a poignant tale that follows the life of 86-year-old Christiane, a woman of strong principles and lyrical storytelling ability, her daughter Catherine and granddaughter Luna, who visit her in France. The novel weaves together the past and present, moving from the story of Christian's father and her early childhood to her modern-day tumultuous relationship with Catherine and her unending affection for Luna. Okay, so the author was born in 1959, and as a child she moved to Geneva, where she later attended law school, and then to New York. Uh, and this book is it's coming out as a paperback original. And it's translated from the French by C. John de Lugo. It first came out in uh, 2016. Okay. The Devil's Reward. All right, so we've got, we've got a, a mixed bag here so far. Let's get that in there. That's another spring release. Of course, uh, spring is entirely theoretical here in Boston. I am making this video 12 hours in advance of our next state shuttering blizzard. And the one after that is already firmly forecast for the middle of the week. So... The uh, pattern that Boston has been in for the last, oh, I don't know, eight weeks of just solid, unrelenting, brutally cold, sequential, state-shuttering, whiteout blizzards is apparently not going to change, despite what the, the month on the calendar says. So, so spring, I guess, I'll always just use it with air quotes now. <laughs> All right, so what have we got here? Uh, hmm, okay, this is also something I did not request. This is out already. This is from Harvard University Press. And it's poetry. Nikos Eng Engonopoulos. Nikos Engonopoulos, who's referred to here as uh, Greek's surrealism, Greek surrealism's most provocative poet. Those of you in Greece, do you know this person? Nikos Engonopoulos? Sorry about the sunlight there. I'm soaking in as much of it as I can because we're scheduled for five more days of... Uh, horizontal snow and sleet. So, uh, he was born in 1907 and died in 1985. One of the most prominent representatives of the Greek surrealist poetry and painting movement. I don't know him at all. Uh, so this is a, yet another work in translation. Uh, this is translated by David Connolly as part of Harvard's early modern, uh, early modern and modern Greek library. And it is, uh, it is bilingual. That's awesome. Greek on one side, English on the other. That is awesome. Okay. All right, and it's uh, it's out already, so I really have to give it. I really have to pay it some attention right away. Uh, all right, let's see. Let's move on here. We don't have any boxes this time around. Just a, just a, a friendly armful of packages that my mail carrier gave me, and then the two of us talked about Easter. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, all right. Uh, so we went through a whole bunch of interesting miscellaneous books, wondering in the back of our mind, are we going to hit a Steve book? And then the Steve book that we hit is the mother of all Steve books. <laughs> this is by Adam McClosey, and this is The Dog, A Natural History. <laughs> okay, this is due any day. Uh, and it is, I guess, what it says on the tin. Yes, it is. Look at that. <laughs> It's all about the, the history, the naturalization of, of dogs. <laughs> and then in the back, uh, we have uh, just a, a color glossary of breeds. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, so what is uh, the affection quotient of a beagle? Moderate. <laughs> The sturdy, bustling beagle requires plenty of activity. They are bold and alert, showing no aggression or timidity. As pack dogs, they are exceptionally tolerant of other dogs, but also very sensitive to separation. In spite of their easygoing nature with children, they are not necessarily the best pet for a child because their training is not without challenges. <laughs> not without challenges. <laughs> 
That's hilarious. <laughs> they actually don't care much about other dogs or anybody or anything else other than you. Uh, but let's let's take just a stroll and see who else we can find. These are the faces of my life. These are my people. Uh, let's see. Let's see what they say about the miniature schnauzer. That's what my little girl would look like if she weren't a messy tomboy. If I took her to a groomer, that's what she'd look like. Their affection level is high. I can attest to that. This is the friendliest dog I've ever had. Uh, and let's see, under behavior, miniature schnauzers are intelligent, highly trainable, and are among the best in agility contests. However, due to their independent nature, they can also be stubborn. So owners must show them that they are really mean that they really mean what they say of course i don't <laughs> i don't the foremost dis discovery that my own dogs make about me is that i don't mean what i say <laughs> they're here for an eye blink of time and then they're gone they're I'm, I'm patting them and i'm kissing their faces and i'm strictly telling them don't do that and way in the back of my mind i'm already picturing holding them in my arms during their last breath. And when you're picturing that, it's impossible to be strict. <laughs> so, uh, I try to lay down the law, but I don't do a very good job. <laughs> uh, they are alert watchdogs, but not fighters. Proper early socialization and enrolling in sports activities can ensure the puppies grow up to a well-rounded dog. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, who else have we got here? Of course, you know the one I'm going for. If, if it's in here, I don't know who it will be. Uh, maybe not. No. Oh, my. How can that be? Uh, let's give it one more look here just to be sure. Is it possible that the Basset Hound is not in here? Oh, it's, oh, it's just an abbreviated list of, uh, of dogs. I guess for, for hounds, we're going to do with a beagle and let it go at that. Uh, all right. So that, that, I guess, makes sense. And besides, it would only be a litany of woe. <laughs> If, were, if they did this for the Basset Hound, it would only be a litany of woe. <laughs> so I'm glad the miniature schnauz is in there, although I'm I'm never going to have another one. So, all right. So this is this is uh, I mean I haven't I haven't read this yet. I will I will of course bump this right to the head of the list. But if these things are of a muchness, right? These natural histories of dogs. It, it will be all the theories about uh, how dogs originated, evolutionarily speaking. Some of which I disagree with. There's a fringe. Uh, theory that I, the more I read about it, the more I like it, which is the dogs did not originate from wolves, but were their own species all along. And that and they're very similar to wolves, but that they're, that the animal that we now think of as Canis familiaris has in fact a progenitor different from Canis lupus. The more I look at that theory, the more I like it. Uh, and also I like that it makes simple, self-evident sense. It, that's always bothered me. The the you, when you read a book like this, and I'm sure it will be in this book. The odds are extremely likely that it will be just repeated in this book. That wolves, dogs, were domesticated from wolves because wolves were social animals. They also hunted in packs, like early man. They would hang around the encampments of early man for garbage and for handouts. They therefore became familiar enough to let early man handle their pups. And some of those pups were then domesticated. And over time, it takes actually very little time, uh, they became dogs. They became domesticated creatures, not wild anymore. And if you've ever been in the wild, if you've ever hiked out, I mean, way out, weeks away from, from humanity, and especially if you've ever encountered wolves in the wild, <laughs> then... Your acceptance of that whole chain of step-by-step -step, uh, evolution of the, of the domesticated dog comes to a screeching halt with, and the adult wolves let the humans play with their pups. <laughs> it comes to a screeching halt there. Never mind giving them table scraps. You could give them weekly payments to a bank account in Zurich, and they wouldn't do that. <laughs> and that's always bothered me about the standard theory. The, you don't see it happen with wolves in the wild. <laughs> and that that always bothers me because if it if that were that process is easily duplicatable today and yet it can't be so uh anyway <laughs> i would strongly recommend a book like this this is the latest one and it's very pretty so if you're if you're a dog fan or if you have a dog fan that you want to buy a present for uh i can recommend this without even looking through it because uh, well with only looking through it because it is beautiful uh and they like i said they're they they tend to hew a common line, so it won't be uh, very different. And then we have this last package, and then one other book. 
that, uh, that I opened on my own that I want to show you because it's, it's a direct interest to all of us. Uh, what is this now? Oh, great. All right, great. This is also a finished copy of something that comes out this month. Uh, this is the, the lovely finished copy. It does come out this month, yes? Yes, of David Studdard's new book on uh, Alcibiades. This is called Nemesis. Uh, the subtitle is Alcibiades and the Fall of Athens, and it's all about himself. It's all about the, one of the most enigmatic and interesting characters in ancient Greek history, uh, who's in all of the novels. He's, he was on everybody's mind. Uh, it's not a whole, he's even, he even wanders into a, a Socratic dialogue. Uh, that's not, that's not a whole lot new, I would imagine. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Alcibiades is one of the most dazzling figures of the golden age of Athens. A ward of Pericles and a friend of Socrates, he was spectacularly rich, bewitchingly handsome and charismatic, a skilled general and a ruthless politician. He was also a serial traitor, <laughs> infamous for his dizzying change of loyalty in the Peloponnesian War. And this book tells the story of this extraordinary life and the turbulent world that Alcibiades set out to conquer. Okay, so Alcibiades routinely gets um, inviting popular histories, and this is the latest one, in a very pretty edition from Harvard University. So... Uh, it, I haven't actually read it. It, it, I have the advanced copy and I, it's just been sitting on the shelf. So now I have a perfect reason to, all right. Uh, and it also counts as a Steve book. Of course, anybody who shows up in Plutarch counts as a Steve book. And then the last book is one I opened already, but I wanted to show it to you because I, I, it fascinates me. And it also is at the front of my reading list, uh, for this week. And it's called Reader Come Home by Marianne Wolfe. And it's about reading in the digital age and whether or not the digital age is changing uh, the neuroconnectivity at the basis of reading just in general. Uh, I want to like, kind of read you some of this. Um, uh, uh, since the author's first book, which was a decade ago, the ways we process written language have changed dramatically, and with many concerned about both our own changes and those of our children. New research on the reading brain chronicles these changes in the brains of children and adults as they learn to read while immersed in a digitally dominated medium. Drawing deeply on this research, Reader Come Home comprises a series of letters Wolf writes to us, her beloved readers, to discover her concerns and hopes about what is happening to the reading brain as it unavoidably changes to adapt to digital mediums and raises difficult questions for our children and ourselves. Concerns about attention span, critical reading, <laughs> and over-reliance on technology are never just about children. Wolf herself has found that, though she is a reading expert, her ability to read deeply has been impacted as she has become inevitably increasingly dependent on screens, meaning it's been lessened. Uh, There's not a surprise underneath the inept use of impact as a verb in that sentence. It's not like it could all of a sudden at the end turn out, whoa, it got better. No, the verb there is worsened, not impacted. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, she draws on neuroscience, literature, education, technology, and philosophy, and blends historical, literary, and scientific facts with down-to-earth examples uh, and warm anecdotes to, il to illustrate complex ideas that culminate in a, in a proposal for a biliterate reading brain. Uh, and that sounds fascinating to me. So I, I wanted to make sure I got it on camera be uh, to the extent that I can here. Let's see if we can get rid of the spotlight there. To uh, to make sure that you see it, because I think when the time comes, this is due in August, you'll be interested in reading it. Who wouldn't be? Uh, especially in, in the BookTube community. Um, so there you go. We have uh, The Dog, A Natural History. We have a new biography of Alcibiades. Uh, we have a collection of the poetry of Nikos Engonopoulos. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, White Hot Grief Parade, but uh, Soul Ripping Grief and Other Yuck Fests. <laughs> we have uh, The Devil's Reward, a French novel in translation. We have uh, The Four, uh, Four Princes by John Julius Norwich, about four men who shaped the Renaissance world of Europe and beyond. Uh, and Reader Come Home, about the changes in reading that have been wrought by the electronic age. So that is an unexpected Sunday haul. <laughs> only because I did the unthinkable. I, I forgot <laughs> that I had a pile of free books sitting there on the counter. <laughs> and my only excuse is that I was totally caught up in other things, some of which 
uh, were involved company and could not, were so much fun that I, I, I couldn't have not got caught up in them. And some of which involved writing, which even for me, I, I view writing as a very domesticated procedure. It doesn't control me. I control it. I don't, I'm not governed by moods at all. But even so, I can have a groove as well as anybody else. And I was in one and it made me totally forget to do this earlier, <laughs> but better late than never. So we have books and we'll move on. Uh, because unless the blizzard stops mail deliveries tomorrow, I will get more books then. So I will, I will see you then as we continue our holomatic. <laughs> Thank you, book two.